turn with us to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Back up. Okay. 
He didn't say mother, he said father, right? Okay. He didn't say Rebecca, I mean Sarah, he said what? Abraham. He did not say Rebecca, he said Isaac. And then he said, and the God of Jacob, not the God of Rachel. So again, he's calling who? Me. He said, for he was afraid to look upon God. But he's calling men. First Corinthians, you don't have to turn there, but in First Corinthians 15, chapter and verse 22, it says, For as in Adam all die. He didn't say Eve, even though Eve partook of the fruit. In fact, she was first in the what? Transgression. She ate from the tree first. But God is looking to the man. Amen. And if God started out like this, he's still doing this. He's still looking at the man. I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And again, our subject, man up. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Yes, the woman bears some responsibility, but God is looking at the man to be the head of the woman. In fact, that's what the book says. God is the head of Jesus, Jesus is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. Amen. So he's looking at the man. But as we look at the world, can we say man has done a great job? No, we cannot. When we look at our political situation, when we look at our situation, especially here in this nation, as far as race relations are concerned, uh, it don't look good. It looks bleak. As we look at the illegal drug use in this country and we see over and over and over the opiates that are killing people every single day. They continue to die from overdosing on these drugs. As we look at our families in this nation and we see the divorce rate is extremely high, also we look at uh, where there are people that are not even marrying today. They're shacking up and, and just doing any and everything they want. We call them baby dads. The suicide rate is even ranked 10th in our nation today. So uh, as man being the head, as man being taking the lead, we're not seeing man do a good job. When we look at the church even, there's a falling away in the church. People are not attending church like they used to when as a race, this was our focal point. As a race during the civil rights movement, this is where we met. This is where we prayed. This is where we came together. This is where we made plans. Before we broke huddle and went out to do what we prayed about doing. This is the place to be. But today, it's, it's, it's falling further and further away from that. But when we look at man, it's obvious that Things are not going well. So we need to man up. We need to take on the responsibility that God has put upon us. Yeah, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we're going to just focus on one particular verse at this point. Look at that 13th verse. The scripture says, watch ye. You see, as men, we need to be on watch. We need to be aware of what is going on around us. We need to look at our society, first of all, and see what's going on. Look at our families and, and see what's going on. What is it that I need to do? We need to be on watch. And, 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 and if the scripture is calling us to be on watch, evidently we are not doing what we're supposed to do. We've fallen asleep. 
So if he's saying, watch ye, then he wants us to wake up and be aware of what's going on around us. Let's go back to chapter 15 of this same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at that 34th verse. The scripture says, awake to righteousness and sin not. You see, we need to wake up, look around us, wake up and, and see what's happening. Wake up and see what we need to do right there at home with our families that this nation will become a better nation. But we've got to do it in righteousness, as you can see. Not just be aware or wake up. And again, we're not talking about a physical awakening, but we're talking about a spiritual awakening. Amen. Amen. And that's where we are lacking in this nation. We are spiritually asleep today because there's so much going on, so much that Christians can take a stand and work against. He said, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We are leaning to our own understanding. We need to wake up and apply the word of God to our lives, to our families, to where we ever, where we attend work or in our communities. Wake up, be aware of what's going on around us. We need to be aware. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, especially 1 Peter chapter 5. Wake up and be aware especially of our adversary. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's look at that 8th verse. The scripture reads, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The scripture says to be sober. Yeah. Now, if you are a high or drunk, that's, you're not sober. That's right. you, you, you're not aware of what's going around you. It's, it's just like being asleep, really. So he wants us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Wake up and realize that the devil is at work. Amen. That there's someone that is working against us. And we need to wake up and be aware of that. So many Christians are not aware of Satan. When the Bible tells us, don't give place to the devil. You don't give place to him because you've got to know something about him. you got to know what he's about. Know the tricks that he has, that he uses. Now, he has a lot of angles that he can come a lot of ways that he can come. But we should be aware of the things that Satan is trying to do to us. Let's turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Man up. Man up. And it starts with us waking up. Mark chapter 14. Spiritually awake. Not physically. But we need to wake up spiritually. Mark chapter 14. And at 38 verse, the scripture tells us to watch ye and do what? Pray. Wake up. Watch. Be aware of what's going on. Watch ye and pray. Lest ye enter into temptation. Now I want to tell you something. The devil is going to tempt everybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care about your position in church. I don't care if you're fasting. Jesus was fasting. Right. And the devil tempted him with food. Right. He doesn't care. So we got to wake up. He said, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The devil had all kind of angles to come and to tempt us, to get us off track, to get our eyes off of the Lord, the things that we should be about. Amen. Man up. Wake up. Be watchful. Be aware of your surroundings. Realize that the devil is going about as a roaring lion, trying to devour us, trying to take away what God has given us. 
we have to wake up. But again, we look at our society and we see so much stuff that's going on. You know, man enough doesn't mean that, yeah, I got a job or I got a tattoo or I got a earring or, you know, I got a gun in my glove compartment. That's not man enough. That's not man enough. That, that, that's one of the worst things. You know, the, we hear the commercial about the few, the proud, the Marines. You know, Jesus is the one, and we're going to look at it in a few minutes, but Jesus is the one that told us about the few. And if you're a child of God, you are one of the few. You're one of the few. So we need to, to man up and, 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 and take charge, be watchful, and be praying that we not enter into temptation. And if you're doing this, if we are in the Word and we're in prayer, then we can see Satan when he comes, as Jesus did. And we can use Scripture to counter that devil. I'm going to ask you to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He's telling us to man up, that we ought to be on watch, be aware of our surroundings. You know, we looked at the scripture and we saw where God is dealing with man. He said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't call out Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. He didn't call out Eve. He called out Adam. So he's calling us out today, calling men out to do your job. Do what God has called you to do. If you are a father, then you are the priest of your family. He didn't put the woman there to, to bring the children to church. He put man there to lead the family. We shouldn't be laying in the bed and our wives come to us and ask the question, are we going to church today? That shouldn't happen. We should be waking everybody up in that house and say it's time for us to get up to get ready to go to church this morning. Get ready to go to Sunday school this morning. That's what God wants us to do. But if we're not doing that, then guess what? We're asleep. And this is what he's saying in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the watching. You, you need to wake up. You sleep. And then he says, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. He's calling us to stand fast, evidently, because if we, as you read 1 Corinthians, you'll see where they were listening to a lot of philosophy. They were allowing the, the human wisdom to infest the church. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians, that uh, uh, first chapter. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. We've got to stick with the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So he says, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in the 18th verse, Paul had to address this. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Again, they're going according to what people are saying, what these philosophers are saying, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise, he asked. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of of this world, my Lord. The wisdom of this world is pure foolishness with God. A lot of philosophy. Let's go over to chapter 15 and look at what he says there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just one verse in this chapter all the way down to uh, verse 13. I'm sure you're familiar with this chapter. But look at what he says. In that 12th verse, he said, Now if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, if that's what we are preaching, then how say some of you that there is what? No resurrection. How is it that in the church we got some saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain, and you're yet in what? You're still in your sin. But they had this going on in the church. Some of you are saying that there is no resurrection, my Lord. So they allow this humanness, humanism, or this teaching, or these philosophies to come into the church, and they're getting away from the Word of God. So he says, stand fast in the faith. I don't care if nobody's there but you. You stand fast in the faith. You continue to preach the Word of God, teach the Word of God, live out the Word of God. Yeah. As he says, stand fast in the faith. Man up, wake up, okay. and stand fast in the faith. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Again, that third verse. He says, again, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, and then he says, quit you like me. That simply means to act like a man. Act like a man. Quit you like men. We have so many today that are denying manhood. They, 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 they want to go to the other gender. And he's saying, act like a man. Be the man that God has called you to be. It also implicates uh, having courage. I can remember when I was a boy growing up, my dad used to say, and if you heard this before, you finish it for me. He used to say, are you a man or what? A mouse. <laughs> Somebody else, daddy, told him the same thing. I said, are you a man or a mouse? Act like a man. Show some courage is what he's saying. Quit you like me. First Corinthians. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It shows that you're acting like a man. Look at that first verse. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto Carnal. And that means you got a mind like the world. You, you haven't grown in the faith. You're still thinking like the people in the world think. And then he says, even as unto what? Babes, Babes in Christ. Act like a man. Quit be like men. Be strong. But you got to what? You got to grow up. You got to mature. When we say man, we're not talking about a child. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And let's look at that 20th verse. 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. The scripture reads, Brethren, be not what? Children. Don't be like a child when it comes to understanding. How be it in malice be ye children? Now, you can be like a child when it comes to malice, and, and that's having an all against someone, or fussing and fighting all the time. You know, yeah, we don't want you to, you know. But then he says, but in understanding, be what? Be men. Yeah, Grow up, mature, have some courage. In understanding, we want you to be like a man. So this implicates to us some maturity in this thing. But we have so many men that are not mature in the faith today. Amen. And because of that we have all of the problems that we have. Because we don't have a foundation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, we are the priest of the family. And God expects the man. And again, when we, we read it. He went and he called Adam. He didn't call Eve. 
when he went looking for them after they had eaten and they went in and sold these uh, fig leaves together and covered themselves, he did not call the woman. He called the man. Right. So the man needs to man up. Amen. Quit you like me and act like a man. Amen. Stop being weak and take upon responsibility. I'm going to tell you something. It's a weak man that can have three and four children by three and four different women. They ain't taking care of none of them. Right. And some of them got their chest up. Yep. I got a son over here. I got a daughter over there. And, and, and you're not taking care of them. Yep. It means nothing right. when it comes to God. It's the worst position to be in that you have children that you are not taking care of. And I don't mean just buying pamphlets for or, or, or buying a ticket to a concert or whatever it might. I'm not talking about that. That's, that has a little something to do with it, but you need to be there. You need to be there when there are questions that need to be ans answered by that parent, that male parent. There's some things a man need to be there for. Specifically, it's important. And we wonder why we have so many boys today that are not manning up because they didn't have a man there to start with to show them how to man up, how to act responsibly as a man. So the Lord is telling us this morning, spiritually, wake up. Can't you see that we're drowning in society? You look around you and things are just going down the drain. You look around you and you can see that the most important thing we're not putting emphasis on. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the most important thing. We're going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 7 real quick. And we're about to close. Matthew chapter 7. Man up. Matthew chapter 7. The scripture reads. In that 13th verse, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto what? Life. And few there be that find it. So this is the few, this is the proud, this is the Christian. Yeah, if the man is not part of the few, then he's part of the problem. Again, if we as men, if we as fathers, if we're not on the straight and narrow path, then guess what? We are part of the problem because the scripture says that we are on our way to destruction. We don't want to be leading our family to destruction. We should want to lead them to eternal life, lead them to life, an abundant life in Christ. But we are asleep. And it's obvious as we look around us in our society, we can see the failures. As God has called us, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God has called us, Adam, to be about our father's business. Yes, we need to man up. And if you man up spiritually, then everything else is going to fall in place. Amen. Let us close by going to uh, 1 Corinthians again and close out the last part, very last part. That 13th verse. Again, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, Quit you like men. And the last thing he says is what? Be strong. Be strong. He's not talking about physically strong. He's talking about being spiritually strong. And I want to tell you something. You cannot be uh, uh, strong within your own self. Because that's not going to get you. Because at some point... Money is not the answer. At some point, even your words are not the answer. We need to be in a relationship with Christ. Amen. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. He says, be strong. You can't strengthen yourself. Amen. 
So if you could strengthen yourself, then guess what? You'll never be weak. You'll never be, be a, a troubled by stuff if you could strengthen yourself. So we need another source to strengthen us. Ephesians 6 and verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You can only be strong in the Lord. Only be strong in Jesus Christ. You must have a relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be strong. You can do all you want. You can try every little thing you want. And it's going to fail because you're on the road to destruction anyway. But if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Word says that He will renew our strength. And it comes through Him. You see, Satan uh, is a spirit. And there's spiritual warfare. You read this chapter that is going on. And if you're going to fight, look at what you're fighting against. You're wrestling not against flesh and blood in that 12th verse, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. This is the spiritual. You can't wrestle physically with a spirit. It has to be spiritually done. And that's going to have to be through Jesus Christ. Amen. He says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. That's a personal thing. You don't have to go get mom or dad or the pastor or the deacon and say, help me fight this spiritual. No, you do it. That's right. You do it. You're a Christian. You get on your knees and you pray. You get into the word of God and you meditate. You believe what you're meditating on. The Bible here says, put on the whole arm of God. It didn't say, uh, 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 get somebody to put that armor on you. You put it on. Put on God's armor. And fight against this devil that's coming against us. We preached quite a bit last week about the devil and how he attacks us in our minds. It's not physical, it's spiritual. You may have some physical problems, but it's still what? It's still spiritual that you got to deal with when it comes to the devil. So let us man up. Yeah. Quit you like men, but be mature. Have some courage in the Lord, oh, yeah. and we will be successful. We will be a vessel of honor and not dishonor. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, you'd be surprised at how one individual, how one man can affect an entire family and even an entire uh, a neighborhood. Or it can also, depending on uh, your children, how many people that can be affected by your children. Yeah. I want to tell you something uh, that took place years ago. There was a man by the name, some of you may have heard of this man before, by the name of David Blair. David Blair was born November 11, 1874. He died January 10, 1955. David Blair was a, a British merchant seaman, and he worked for the White Star Line, which had assigned him to be on the Titanic. But just before the Titanic pulled off on his first voyage, he was reassigned to another ship. And since it was so late that they did this, in his haste to depart, he accidentally kept a key in his pocket. This key was to a locker in the what they call the crow's nest where you go all the way up to the top of the ship and you can look out and, and see what's out ahead. But he mistakenly, in haste, took those keys with him. And because of that, the people who were going to look out, and their names were Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee. These were the two guys that were to be up there in that tower looking out. But because he was in a hurry and took the keys to this locker, 
they were unable to be able to get into that locker to get the binoculars to look out to see how things were up ahead. Of course, we all know what happened with the Titanic and thousands of people, or hundreds of people died because of that accident. But you know, when things happen, we have a, always get a, a group, a, a commission together. And even back then, in 1912, there was a commission that came together, composed of members of the United States Congress. And they asked these two men a question. They asked whether or not they would have seen the iceberg, and I'm reading verbatim what was recorded. They would have seen the iceberg from farther away if they had had those binoculars. They replied that they would have seen a bit sooner. Then they asked, when asked, how much sooner? He responded, well, enough to get out of the way of the iceberg. One key. One key is all what was needed to more than likely save the lives of hundreds of people. God has given man the key. Come on, Many lives can be saved. We've been put in charge, Adam. We need to man up because God has given us the key, his word, the instructions to do what we need to do as men. He said, quit you like me. Yeah. Act like a man. Be the man that God has called you to be. We have the keys in our pocket. All we have to do is to use it, to act on what God has given us. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Is there one today? The same God that has spoken to us to man up.